If anybody in here has ever used terrible conference or hotel or airport or even airplane Wi-Fi before, can you just stand up? If anyone's ever tried to frantically find the address for a meeting, oh, stay stood up, stay stood up, stay standing up. If anyone's ever tried to frantically find the address for a meeting or a restaurant as you're jumping into the back of a cab or jumping on the metro, please stand up. Uh, if you or anybody you know has got a pay-as-you-go data plan where you pay for your mobile data as you use it, just stand up. If you've ever lost internet connection at your home or office before and had to tether your mobile phone for a few days, please stand up. Right, and if any of you have ever been abroad and had a super expensive or very restrictive data roaming plan, where using your phone abroad is very, very expensive, please also stand up. Okay, so anybody who is left sitting down, just take a moment and look around you and realize that you are by far the exception rather than the rule. Nearly every single person in this room today has suffered a degraded performance experience that was not their fault. My name's Harry, and I'm here to talk about why fast matters. Right, yeah, you can all sit down now, thank you. Right, that's the 90-second version of this talk. Uh, for the next sort of 40 minutes, we're going to look at why performance is important, uh, who it's important for, and then some strategies, some tips, uh, some workflows to actually start building faster web applications. Uh, I'm from a place called Leeds in the north of England, and I'm a consultant front-end developer. This means I help uh, lots of different clients, clients like these, making much larger, much more scalable, and very importantly, much faster websites. One of these clients on here is particularly interesting, Trainline. Uh, the Trainline uh, came up with some research recently, and they found that if they reduced latency by just 0.3 seconds, customers would spend an extra 8.1 million pounds every year. Over 8 million pounds for the sake of being 0.3 seconds faster. Now, I'm actually helping the train line with this body of work, and it's absolutely fascinating. And the good news is, it's actually kind of easy to find 0.3 seconds somewhere, right? It's not, uh, it's not like completely impossible. You just need a bit of diligence, a bit of knowledge. And that's going to equate to about 8 million pounds for train line. Uh, Netflix, who unfortunately isn't a client of mine. If anyone from Netflix is watching, send me an email. Uh, Netflix saw a 43% decrease in their bandwidth bill after turning on gzip. Now, my first question is, why was gzip turned off in the first place, right? Who did, th who did that? But they saved 43% of their bandwidth bill just by enabling one performance-related feature. I hope whoever turned gzip on got a handsome pay rise that day, because imagine saving 43% of your bandwidth bill at Netflix's scale. Uh, GQ, the fashion magazine, the lifestyle magazine, they cut load times by an impressive 80%. And in return, they saw an 80% increase in traffic. And of that increased traffic, they saw time on site increase by 32%. So even if you're not an e-commerce platform, even if your site does not directly sell to customers, performance leaves users happier and also increases engagement. And if you're running adverts, sorry to mention it, but if you are running adverts, increasing ad impressions by a third is going to equal quite a lot of money. Now, each of these statistics was grabbed from a site called WPOstats.com, Web Performance Optimization Stats. And this is a website run by uh, Tim Cadleck, who is also going to be speaking for us today, and um, Tammy Everts, who's a performance engineer as well. This site is full of case studies, examples, reports, and write-ups for why performance helps businesses. The reason I chose those three particular case studies is that the first one proved that performance will make us more money. Performance will make your business more money. Two, it will probably save your business money. In the case of Netflix, 43%. And the third one showed us that performance just makes users happier. I don't think anybody in the world enjoys using a slow website. But a lot of these are financial. A lot of these are sort of financial reasons to promote uh, performance, financial reasons to make websites fast. But I want to talk about a few things that aren't to do with money. These are more to do with ethics and morals in web performance. I'm going to share three stories with you. Uh, what's quite interesting about these three stories is they all happened directly to me, and they all happened this year. So I'm not talking about the internet five years ago. I'm talking about the internet right now in 2017. Uh, the first thing, 
I um, sent an email to a friend, and it was quite an important email. And he didn't reply to me, and I was getting stressed because I needed a reply. So I pestered him. I was like, hey, dude, did you get my email? And he said, oh, sorry, yeah, I, I got your email, but I was on holiday in Thailand, and the mobile internet in Thailand is so bad that even though I saw the notification, I couldn't actually open the email. It wasn't like a crazy like, you know, 25 meg tiff that someone had sent. It was just a normal email. The internet in Thailand wasn't good enough to open it. The second one, this one, uh, it's quite a long slide. I'm going to have to read something from my notes. But um, I got an email from someone asking me for some advice. He wanted some advice to do with web development. And this happens quite often. And I sent my reply. And it took him a long time to get back to me. And when he did respond about two weeks later, he said, hey, I'm sorry for the delayed reply. I'm on a bad connection. Now, me being a performance engineer, I just said to him, hey, don't apologize, but tell me everything you can about your bad connection. What do you mean by that? And he said, so I'm currently at my parents' place in Rajasthan, which is in India. Since my parents don't have a computer, they only consume internet through their smartphone. We rely on internet services by telecom providers, which in our town are still 2G. Some providers claim to be 3G, but I've never seen that happening. So right now, I've connected my laptop via a Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, and opening Gmail in the basic HTML version takes 30 seconds to a minute. Most other sites, I actually prefer to use mobile Chrome rather than my laptop, because that seems to work faster and consumes less data. Google also optimizes a lot for slow connections, which definitely helps. So a few interesting things here. The basic version of Gmail, I've used that maybe twice in my life. When I've been on a really bad connection, I've maybe used it twice. This person has to use it every day, and it still takes a minute to load the basic version of Gmail. The other interesting thing, when you go home, you've probably got a router in the corner of your room that gets you online. This guy's family don't have a router. They've got a commodity Android device plugged into the wall with a permanent 2G connection. That is their main entry point to the internet. It's very, very different to what we're used to. Third little story, and my favorite story, a Nepalese developer sent me a direct message on Twitter, again, asking for some advice. Um, now, completely coincidentally, about a week beforehand, I'd been looking at my Google Analytics. Uh, we'll come back to Google Analytics in a second. Analytics had told me that Nepal was a problem region for me. My website was slow in Nepal. So I messaged this guy saying, hey, look, whilst I have your attention, does my website feel slow for you? My analytics says that it does. Is, is that true? His response was, no, I don't think so. I click through to your website, and it loads in less than a minute. Think about that. If a website took a minute to load here in Europe, we'd assume the website was down. We would assume it was broken. We'd just go somewhere else. But to him, that was normal. Right? Under a minute felt fast. The second thing I want you to think about is it's my job to have a fast website. I have optimized every last little piece of my website to make it fast. If you visit my website from Dublin or San Francisco, it will be fully rendered in under 1.7 uh, seconds, I think. right? In Nepal, that site takes just under a minute. Imagine what it's like visiting websites that haven't been optimized. Think about what the internet would feel like on a day-to-day -day basis for someone in Nepal. Now, each of these stories have an interesting thing in common. They all happened in Southeast Asia. They happened in India, they happened in Nepal, and they happened in Thailand. There's a body of work being spearheaded by Google at the moment called the Next Billion Users. And this is about getting the next billion internet users online and connected. If you just Google next billion users, you'll find a lot of resources. But the Quartz, uh, they have a really good canonical sort of page here, which lists lots of case studies and resources. You may have seen this graphic before. More people live inside the highlighted area than outside of it. Even taking into account how much ocean is under that highlighted area, more people live inside of it than outside of it. These are our next billion users. These are emerging economies. When you consider that this contains places like China, all of India, um, Indonesia, Bangladesh, you soon see where those people come from. It's a very, very dense population. But these are our next billion users. And let's, let's take a look at some statistics. Let's see what the internet is like for these people. In Bangladesh, the average connection is around 3.5 meg. Uh, just 15% of the population are online at all. With 3.9 million people with a dedicated broadband subscription, that represents just 2.4% of the population. 2.4% of the population have a dedicated fast connection. With 134 million cellular subscribers, that represents 83% of the population getting online via high latency, low bandwidth cellular connections. 
In Bangladesh, 34 times more people get online with mobile than they do with broadband. Moving to India, again, 3.5 meg average connection. A quarter of people are online. With 17.1 million broadband subscribers, that represents just 1.3% of the population with a dedicated fast connection. With a billion, and that's billion with a B, with 1 billion cellular subscribers, we're looking at 79% of the population getting online purely through a mobile connection. 58 times more people in India use a mobile connection instead of broadband. Pakistan, unfortunately, they're the slowest. 2.5 meg average connection. Uh, a fifth of the people online, 1.8 million on broadband is just 1% of the population. And with 126 million cellular subscribers, uh, we've got 67% of the population online via mobile. That represents 70 times more people using low bandwidth, high latency connections to get online. The most interesting one is Indonesia. It's got the fastest connection, 4.5 meg. A fifth of Indonesians are online. Um, with 2.8 million broadband subscribers, that's just 1.1% of the population using a dedicated, fast connection to get online. However, where it gets interesting, with 338 million cellular, subscri cellular subscribers, that actually represents uh, an unusual 132% of people getting online via mobile. What this tells you is that Indonesia, a lot of people have more than one device. Perhaps they've got a family phone that sits in the corner. Who knows? Southeast Asia is the fastest growing market in the world, the internet market in the world, and Indonesia is its fastest growing country, so maybe that explains why 121 times more people in Indonesia get online with a slow cellular connection instead of broadband. Aggregating this data, a 3.5 meg average connection, only a fifth of that region is online at all. The other four fifths, the other 80% of people, that's our next billion users. Those are who we need to target. Uh, just 1.5% have fast internet. Only 1.5% of that reason, uh, region has a dedicated broadband subscription. A staggering 90% of that region can get online with a mobile connection. This truly is a mobile-first region. Compare that with the UK, where I'm from. 15 meg speeds, everybody's online. 92% of England is online. Um, over a third of people have broadband, and 125% of people have a cellular subscription. People have more than one device in England. I've got more than one device myself. Poland, where we are right now, 13 meg speeds. Two-thirds of you are online. Uh, a fifth of you are on broadband. And you've got a lot of devices. 150% of you are online. So a lot of you have more than one device. Anyway, that's a lot of numbers. What does this even tell us? It tells us a few things. It tells us that in the West, we build for a very different demographic. In the West, we are spoiled with low latency connections, uh, high bandwidth, affordable data plans. In the East, or in emerging markets, we've got a very, very different profile of user. Culturally, it's going to be very, very different, but it comes down to specific technological impact, right? We've got to optimize for high latency, low, broadband, uh, sorry, low bandwidth connections. Very, very, very expensive data plans. Data is really cheap in the UK, comparably. Data is very cheap in the rest of Europe, comparably. So a lot of clients ask me, how fast is fast enough? Harry, how fast should we be? Um, I've got some bad news that there's, I don't know, I don't know. I can't tell you how fast you should be. I can't just give you a number to work with. What you can do is, over time, run tests and benchmarks and look at your competitors and work out how roughly how fast you should be. But building up that bank of data takes a little while. So I always recommend starting with just be faster than your nearest competitor. Pretty much everyone can agree with this. Find out who your nearest competitor is, find out how, how fast they are, and just be that little bit faster. Being faster than a competitor is often a decider in whether people stay with a service or move elsewhere. I found a really good, useful, tiny little simple tool recently called DareBoost. DareBoost, you just put in one site and another site that is very similar, and it'll run some static analysis. It'll run some uh, comparisons and see which site is faster. It's a really simple overview of getting a good idea of how fast you are. Uh, I'm comparing my site to CSS Tricks right now, and I'm quite a lot faster than CSS Tricks. But what you have to remember is that Chris is running a very different website. It's actually, uh, his is more of a community, whereas mine is a personal site with quite a large blog. 
But this gives us a really good start. Dareboost.com, it tells us roughly how fast we are compared to a competitor. We can step it up a notch. We've actually got better tooling than that available to us. Um, speed Curve. We will look at Speed Curve in more detail later, but this is my favorite performance tool. Speed Curve is amazing. You sign up to Speed Curve with your website, with your account, but you can also pass in competitors. And Speed Curve will run automatic benchmarks against you and your competitors' websites. So here we can see that uh, the Huffington Post is quite a lot slower. The blue squiggle is quite a lot slower than the others. We can see that the New York Times and the Guardian have quite similar performance profiles. Uh, the Guardian is slightly faster, but we, what we can see here is that Huffington Post is definitely losing the race. OK, how do we get there? It's all well and good knowing these numbers and these facts and figures. How do we actually start building faster websites? Where do we look? Luckily, I've got three tips to share with you. And they're not really like small tips. They're quite big sort of philosophies. And I've already lied to you because there's four. Um, the zeroth step is just want a fast website. Right? Step zero is just try to build something fast. Building fast websites isn't particularly simple. It's not going to happen by accident. And it takes a concerted effort from you and your team to actually make this happen. So do not underestimate the importance of this step. Things get a lot easier if you actually try to make it happen. Uh, make sure the business, product owners, clients, customers, whoever, engineers, designers, make sure everybody is taking performance seriously. And you will find that everything gets a lot, lot simpler to achieve. This is the biggest culture shift. This is actually relatively difficult, right? This is a quite a difficult step. But if you can manage this, you will find that performance or making performant applications becomes much, much easier. You're not fighting against the tide. You're not arguing with designers about design features. You're not arguing with customers about what they want or clients. Once everybody starts actually trying to build a fast website, you'll see that it will happen quite quickly. So step one the real steps, is uh, understand the problem. But like, really, really understand the problem. Try your site from different points of view. Try your site in different conditions. Being fast on a fiber connection on a nice new MacBook Pro in the middle of a well-connected city, that's not really fast. That doesn't count. Being fast on a commodity Android device on a 2G connection in the middle of a field, that's fast. Being fast there is fast for everyone. If you set the, bench, uh, the benchmark to be uh, very, very high, and you achieve speeds in really adverse conditions, every single person around the planet will benefit from that. Facebook did something interesting a few years ago. They came up with something called 2G Tuesdays. 2G Tuesdays, basically, uh, once a week, on a Tuesday, oddly enough, uh, they throttled the Facebook.com service to a 2G connection. Anyone internally, any Facebook staff, so product owners, engineers, visiting Facebook.com on a Tuesday would experience it just how someone in an emerging market would experience it. They soon learned of the frustrations that people have. Trying to visit Facebook.com on a 2G connection is not easy. And this led Facebook to understand the problem way better. Now, actually setting something like this up for your company, I imagine, would be quite difficult. I couldn't set this up. You'd have to like, have whitelisted IP addresses and do something on the router. And I, I, honestly, I wouldn't know where to start. But what I do know, and what I have done with clients before, is use something called Charles Proxy. Who's heard of Charles? Not many. So Charles, it, there's a free version. So go and download the free version. And if you like it, it's like $50. Um, but Charles allows you to specifically pinpoint certain domains. So rather than me slowing my entire internet connection down, I can say, well, how about I'll just slow my website down? I will slow CSSWizardry.com down, and I'll also slow Google Fonts down so I know what it's like to visit my own website on a 2G connection. This means that you can still listen to Spotify and watch Netflix. What this will do is it will just throttle the, the connection for specific domains. This is also really good for stress testing third parties. If you've got a third party that you use, um, you know, like uh, you might have something ho jQuery hosted on Google's servers, or you might have uh, a tag manager somewhere. This is really good for stress testing third parties. This is a great place to start. But the bad news is it's not even just about connection speeds anymore. Connection speeds is only half of the battle. Who's got a phone like this in their pocket? Who's, this is an iPhone 7. Does anyone have an iPhone 7? 
or an iPhone 6, like a, a newish iPhone. Anyone got like a, a kind of a, a modern sort of Samsung Android device in their pocket? Yeah, um, I mean, good for you. They're all good, very fast phones. Uh, the bad news is those kind of phones aren't really very representative of emerging markets. According to Google engineers, this phone right here is the most representative if you want to emulate emerging markets. This is the Moto G4. Um, this isn't a very good phone. This isn't a very good phone at all. There's a really simple uh, tool, simple service uh, called Geekophone, which just lets you run simple benchmarks, simple comparisons between two or more devices. Just running an iPhone 7 and the Moto G4 through this service, we find that it's about half as fast. The Moto G4 has roughly 50% of the processing power as an iPhone 7. Immediately halve your current capabilities, and that is what your potential next billion customers are using. For the more data conscious among you, um, uh, phonearena.com is a, a, a much more complex tool, which runs way more in-depth benchmarks. At the top, we see the iPhone, and below it, we see the Moto G4, and bigger is better. What we can see here is that across nearly every single test, the iPhone is three to four times faster than the Moto G4. The device that your customers are using, your next billion users, is about a quarter as good as what you might have in your pocket. Um, in a bind, in the short term, we can just enable throttling in Google DevTools. I'm sure you've all seen Chrome's DevTools uh, throttling. We can spoof a 3G connection. Uh, we can spoof a five times slower CPU. And this is a good start. This isn't perfect, but this is a good start. So if you're not doing this at all, start doing this. If you want to take it a bit further, um, use Charles, right? Because Charles proxy, the tool I just showed you, can actually simulate packet loss. So this slowdown on the network happens in the application layer, so it just artificially slows things down. Whereas with tools like Charles or Network Link Conditioner, you can actually spoof DNS delays. You could spoof packet loss. But this is a great start. Start here. However, having said that, there is no replacement for real devices. Testing on real devices makes all the difference. I've got a, um, a Nexus 5. Um, it's not a Moto G4, but it is, it's a, a representative, like fairly, it's four years old now. Uh, and this phone is a lot, lot slower than my iPhone. This is my testing device. So I just kind of remote debug. Whenever I do audits for clients, or whenever I'm building applications or, or websites for clients, I always make sure I test on realistic conditions. One client I was doing an audit for, uh, this slide isn't very good quality, I'm afraid, because this wasn't actually meant, this screenshot wasn't meant to be in this presentation. <laughs> this is meant to be in like a report for the client. I really hope they don't find it. Um, what I found was their mobile site that their engineers build on high-powered MacBook Pros in an office somewhere in Europe, their mobile site actually performed pretty badly on a mobile device. Fancy that. <laughs> it works well on my new MacBook with a fiber connection. Why doesn't it work well on my phone? I found that their main app.js file, their main JavaScript bundle, took 1.78 seconds just to evaluate. Just to churn over that much JavaScript, the CPU in my Nexus phone, it took it nearly two seconds. And that's just one file. And that is nothing to do with network conditions. That has nothing to do with load times. This is completely divorced from load times. Even if my Nexus was hooked up to super fast Wi-Fi, it would still take nearly two seconds just to evaluate that one JavaScript file. And that happens on every page load. This CPU, this CPU like sort of degradation is really, really common in realistic devices. But because my client wasn't necessarily testing it on real devices, they didn't really know this was going on. So build up an idea of realistic conditions. Try and learn what a realistic connection feels like. Try and learn what realistic latency feels like. Try and learn what realistic processing power feels like. And you can even go as far as to working out just how much data might cost in a different country. You can find out how realistic the cost of visiting your website might be. Step two, know what is going on. Understand everything that happens under the hood. Learn as much as you can about the way your application functions, how it's put together, and who is in charge of what. This is unfortunately the hardest thing in this slide deck. Finding out what's going on is really, really quite difficult. It requires 
a lot of meetings, a lot of communication, a lot of talking to people, but actually finding out what your application is doing across the entire spectrum is a surefire way to make your website faster. If you don't know what your website is actually doing, you don't stand a chance at making it any faster. Who lives in a world like this? Where you look at your production site, and all of a sudden it's like, well, where's this coming from? What does this script do? Why are we including jQuery twice? Which team's in charge of this? Who's, does the analytics team use this? Do we even use this? Is this script here? I've never seen this used. Who experiences this like frequently? OK, maybe half of us. A lot of organizations, especially when organizations, organizations get larger, a lot of different people are in charge of different parts of your application. Other people can add things quite easily. Tag managers, right? You put a tag manager on there, and that one tag manager might just be a small JavaScript file. But that one small JavaScript file allows a marketing person to put a 1,000 JavaScript files on your website. And that's where things start falling down, because we don't fully understand exactly what's happening in our application. There's also this really unfortunate Schrodinger effect. The actual act of measuring users, measuring for optimization, ironically, has an overhead that slows your website down. We'll look at a really good example of this shortly. So for this step, it's a little less technical. I've actually got some good technical tips, but this step is a little less technical. You need to start organizing meetings, chatting to people. Um, you know, go and just meet the head of analytics. Go and meet the head of data and insights. Go for a coffee. Ask them, what do you do? Like, what do you need? What, what information can we as engineers provide to you? Which tools do you use to do that? OK, can I do an audit of this tool? OK, it turns out this tool is very slow. Can we build a similar one, or can we use a different provider? It's not your marketing team's job to know about web performance, but it's your job to help them join the dots. Understand or help them understand that whatever they do has a knock-on effect that will affect the customer. There's a really great article from um, a company called Studio 107, and the article is called uh, Tags Gone Wild, Managing Tag, Man uh, Managing Tag Managers. The green area we can see here represents the website. This is what the user turned up for. This is what the user wants to see. The red is analytics and tracking and adverts and all that kind of crap that no user ever. This is why people have ad blockers, right? Because nobody turned up for this, yet we gave them it anyway. If we pull this out onto a more digestible slide, look at that. That's horrendous. But unfortunately, this is really, really common. We need to start understanding what's going on in here and understanding and knowing our liabilities. We often refer to things as assets. We should stop referring to them as assets and start referring to things as liabilities. Third parties can and will cripple your performance. And I want to show you some real life examples of completely sort of detrimental uh, impact that third parties have had on my customers, my clients' performance. This is a company in the UK. They're uh, an e-commerce fashion brand. Um, I've kind of tried to anonymize them. Because uh, I don't, don't want to upset them. Uh, but they're a really great team. They're a really great company. Their CTO is a very performance-oriented person. Uh, and they hired me to help them make the new version of their website really fast. The old version of their website, we learned that um, this screenshot might be a little small for people at the back. But 98% of the runtime scripting cost was actually brought forward by a third party. 98% of the runtime scripting wasn't our fault. It was done by a third party. Ironically, this third party is an A-B testing tool, which is designed to optimize users' experiences and optimize conversions, yet they are single-handedly contributing almost 100% of the runtime scripting overhead. When you're doing audits, it's really useful to get a view of who is causing you the most problems. So in order to get a view like this, for those who haven't done much in kind of the, the performance or timeline view, fire open DevTools. Go to the performance or, or timeline tab. It depends what version of Chrome you're running as to what it's called. Then run a performance profile. Once you've run that performance profile, you see this big flame chart. You'll see a, a mass of color. But at the bottom, you should see a drawer that just says summary. Next to the word summary is the word bottom up. And then in bottom up, there's a drop down called group by domain. If you don't manage to scribble this down, just find me in the breaks, and I'll happily show you how to get to this point. But this will literally tell you which domain is causing you the most problems. You can quite quickly see that, all right, the reason our website is slow is because this plugin from somewhere else 
has a huge repaint task. Or this plugin here has got some very expensive JavaScript. We can really quickly pinpoint whose fault it is. So we rebuilt the site. We're working on this e-commerce build. We tore it down, and we started again. And like I said, this team is already very performance conscious. Their CTO is a very, very clever person who focuses on performance a lot. The new site was perfect. The marketing team were really, really happy. But the marketing team said, yeah, it's really nice. Can we put the A-B testing tool back on there now? And what happened is the engineering team had managed to make a website that rendered it, its first paint happened at 0.8 seconds. I think that might be some kind of record for an e-commerce site. First paint in 0.8 seconds. Then as soon as they put the, um, the A-B testing tool back in there, that went from 0.8 to 2.1. Now, 2.1 is still quite fast, but 2.1 is a much, much bigger number than 0.8. Um, the painful irony here as well is that this tool is designed to optimize for conversion. You can't optimize for conversion if you're adding over a second delay to your customers, because we know from extensive studies that performance affects conversions. This was an email the CTO sent to me and uh, kind of airing his frustrations. Identifying third parties. This is interesting. So how do we actually find who these third parties are? Have you ever looked at like a, a waterfall chart in either web page test or in Chrome, and you've got no idea what, right, I don't know what this JavaScript does. What does this do? What's this little GIF? Is that like a tracking GIF from this, or is it from the advertisers? Who's ever had that frustration? You look at a waterfall chart, and half of it, you just don't know what it means. Well, luckily, Chrome introduced something recently. Again, this is quite hard to find, so please bear with me. But um, if you want to play the blame game a little more, if you want to find out exactly who's causing you problems, make sure you're running a version of uh, Chrome that has DevTools experiments enabled. So enable your DevTools experiments. Uh, once you've done that, when you go into the settings panel of DevTools, you should see on the left here, uh, experiments. There's an experiments option. Inside experiments, you should find this, network request groups support. A horrible title. That doesn't tell me anything about what this does. What this actually does, though, is it starts identifying third parties, and it tells you, oh, this is a tracking script. This is a tag manager. This is an advertiser. So in order to actually utilize this, we've got another step. Go and run a network, um, sort of, uh, a network chart. Right click on one of the uh, column titles and just turn on product. Once we've turned on product, we see a column that looks like this. How nice is that? Now, all of a sudden, DevTools tells me, oh, this is from Campaign Monitor. This is from DoubleClick. This is from so-and-so. This is a tracking script. This is a tag manager. What this does is it means that I can start blaming other people, right? How nice is that? Not my fault. It's this. So looking at this, I found i um, got a problem here. Something is taking over half a minute to connect, a 35-second TCP connection. And what you should hopefully see is the red line right at the very end. This is pushing back the load event. So this is blocking somehow. This is pushing back the load event to 36 seconds. And I go and look at what it is, and it's Rubicon project. And it turns out Rubicon is an advertiser. This, again, is why people turn ad block off. But at least we can now notice that, OK, the major delay on this page is Rubicon. Maybe we should give them a call. Maybe we should log a support ticket. Maybe we should find another advertiser. This tooling really helps you identify bottlenecks, especially in third parties, because third parties make you very vulnerable. External dependencies can take you completely offline. I want to show you another horror story that happened with a real client of mine. What happens in the most extreme cases? What happens when your third party has a complete outage? So this client of mine is using something called Adobe Tag Manager. Anybody here use Adobe Tag Manager or have a product that uses it? OK, well, lucky you. That's good. If you are using Adobe Tag Manager and the worst case scenario happens, there's kind of bad news. Adobe Tag Manager is a, a render blocking. It's a completely blocking script. So it blocks downloads, and it blocks DOM construction. So while ever the browser is downloading or trying to find that script, the browser can't do anything else. So if Adobe Tag Manager goes down, your load time goes up to about 80 seconds. This is the amount of time that Chrome will try and find something before giving up. This is basically a timeout. For that 1.3 minutes, customers were looking at a completely blank screen. They were looking at nothing at all. Completely blank screen for 1.3 minutes, all for the sake of trying to optimize that user's journey, trying to like A-B test things and use tag managers and tracking scripts. 
Look at the painful irony in that. We're trying to optimize for conversions whilst giving users a blank page for over a minute. After a minute, or after 1.3 minutes, uh, Chrome just decides that, yep, it's not going to happen, and it just gets on, and it renders the rest of the page. If you want to test out your vulnerability to third parties, uh, Web Page Test has got a publicly available black hole server. So if you frequently link to third parties, Google Fonts, for example, or Adobe Tag Manager, in your hosts file, just map their domains against this IP address. Take a picture of this slide. This is a very useful slide. Because you can go home or back to the office, find all your third parties, drop all of their domains in your hosts file, refresh the page, and see what happens. This is how we discovered that the client's website goes offline for over a minute, because we can just channel all of this third party's traffic through a black hole server. Everything just disappears. So don't prioritize your own metrics over your users' experiences. Users don't like slow experiences. They will just go somewhere else. OK, step three, measure everything. It's imperative that we measure absolutely everything we can for two very important reasons. It answers two questions. One, how do we know what's wrong? If we haven't measured anything historically, how do we even know what might be wrong? Then once we start fixing it, how do we know when we've got it right? It's really, really important to have that before and after. Google Analytics, who's got Google Analytics on their site or product? OK, put your hand up if you haven't logged into Google Analytics for like six months. There's a couple of honest people in the room. Right, it, I, I'm guilty of it, right? I don't look at analytics very often, but it turns out Google, Google Analytics is capturing performance data for you. It's not very perfect, it's not ideal, but there's some very rudimentary performance data hidden in Google Analytics. Um, to get there, again, th these are the worst instructions. These slides will be online after the talk, don't worry. Um, to get there, behavior, site speed, page timings, and it will tell you a lot about how your site performs. We can start exploring geographically. We can see exactly which countries perform the worst. I can see here that North America and Northern Europe uh, are pretty good. Somewhere in Africa, they're having a really bad time visiting my website. But we can start to explore geographically where our bottlenecks might be. This is a really useful way of just finding out what's going on. That GIF crashed my machine for a while. Amazing. Oh, come on. We're going to live through it all again. Anyway, um, here we go. That GIF's huge. It crashed. My machine was beach balling. Um, so yeah, with this data, we can start to cross-reference specific pages against specific markets. We can start to learn quite a lot. The US, the UK, nice and fast. It's faster than average. But right there, we can see that, sure enough, India is much slower. India is a lot slower. When you start optimizing your applications, it's important to know where to start. You probably just start with the home page, which kind of makes sense. But your home page might not, might not be the biggest problem. My job now is to work out what's going on on this horizontal navigation article. Why is this page different? What's happening here that isn't happening elsewhere? I was doing this, and I spotted something interesting. Brazil. We haven't really looked at Brazil. Uh, Brazil isn't in Southeast Asia, but Brazil is still an emerging economy. For someone in Brazil to earn enough money to have a 500 meg data plan, they've got to do a full day's work. In order to earn uh, the money to pay for 500 meg, half a gig, they've got to work for nearly nine hours. It turns out, in my phone right now, I've got a travel SIM. It's a SIM card that I only use when I'm roaming because it's much cheaper. Uh, but I use it part time. I use it maybe 30% of my life. In 18 months, I've used 14 gig of data. A Brazilian person would have to work for one month to afford as much data as I've used just traveling in the last year and a half. Astounding. Speed curve. Uh, when, we, when we talk about measuring things, speed curve is probably the gold standard for me. Anyone heard of speed curve? Oh, wow, no one. Right, cool. Um, this tool is, um, I'll warn you right now, it's addictive, right? It's really, really good. So I identified a problem. Brazil was a problem area for me, so I set up some automated tests. I'm going to start testing my site from Brazil. I then tried to fix something. I thought, well, the problem might be this, so that's what I'll try and fix. And sure enough, look at that. I managed to fix a problem. This is the importance of measuring before and after. If I didn't have the before, I wouldn't know Brazil needed fixing. If I didn't have the after, I wouldn't know if I've done my job. So automatically test your site from different locations worldwide. Um, you can run them. Uh, several times a day, uh, different geographical locations, different connection speeds. Really, really great tool. 
And my favorite thing about it is it's good for non-technical stakeholders. I don't, it doesn't matter if you've got like a PhD in computer science or you know nothing about tech, you can understand this graph. Something good happened that day. This is a great tool for putting in front of non-technical stakeholders. Get it on a big screen, put it in the office, make sure everyone can see it, because we can easily see we're making good, positive progress here. Using this data, we set up budgets. Um, most people don't like the word budget, surprisingly enough. Uh, so I just say it's just basically monitoring with a purpose. We're monitoring with a good reason. We can set budgets and tolerances and try and stay within those limits. Uh, I run Speed Curve against my website. My website's pretty simple. It's nothing crazy. It's a fairly average website. Um, it's got the mandatory big masthead image that every website has to have these days. A bunch of images. It's got some analytics. It's got a Twitter widget. It's got a little advert on there. So I've got third parties. So I set myself a task to optimize this website. I set some budgeting. I wanted to begin. Um, I wanted to start rendering my website in under two seconds. So I, the red line represents a budget. This is a test run from Dublin. Dublin's a big data center, like internationally. It's a very well-connected city. So we can find out here that I'm well under my budget every single day. If I'm visiting from a European city, I'm going to start rendering my page in well under two seconds. I set my task of being visually complete in under three seconds. It turns out that start render and visually complete are the exact same thing for me, because my site is set up in a way that it renders immediately. So I'm well, well, well under my budget. Also, there's a bit of waviness in this line, but this, this line is relatively flat. If we were to average it out, it's quite a flat, sort of consistent level. As soon as we visit Brazil, lots more up and down, lots more uncertainty, and I keep going over budget. This is the exact same website, the exact same CDN, the exact same browser, just happens to be from a different country, and we get a result like this. I'm over my budget quite often. To actually be visually complete, uh, I'm one second slower than I am in Ireland. Just by moving to Brazil, my site is a whole second slower. Remember that 0.3 seconds is worth 8.1 million to someone like the train line. That's a big number. Uh, then I set myself a really difficult challenge. I set up a custom profile in Speed Curve that I called Very Bad Network, which kind of sounds like I'm telling off the internet, but it's called the Very Bad Network, in which we've got 150 kilobyte download speeds, upload of 120 kilobytes, uh, latency, uh, we've got an artificial half-second round trip time just to simulate really bad mobile connections, 500 milliseconds of latency, and then 10% packet loss. 10% of everything just goes missing. That's how I've kind of set this thing up. This is really pushing the limits on a very, very, very bad network, and it turns out that I am well over budget. My site isn't fully rendered until nine and a half seconds. I'm actually still really happy with this. Being able to render a site in under 10 seconds in such adverse conditions is something that I'm relatively happy with. But because these conditions are really bad, packet loss, high latency, there is really no consistency to this graph. And if we compare it to the other tests that I'm running, tests in Brazil, in Ireland, in Sydney, in, in, in wherever, we can see just how bad, realistic, high latency, very unstable connections are. There is no variance and there is no predictability. So I'm closing up now. I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so just to kind of recap everything, care. Actually start giving a shit about performance. Just care that your site is fast. Make sure your customers care. Make sure your product owner cares. Make sure your designers care. Actually focusing on this and prioritizing it is the single biggest change you can make to start delivering faster experiences. Understand. Understand as much as you can. Understand your customers. Understand the, the device landscape. Understand how your application works. Understand your customers' needs. Understand the unpredictability of the internet. And measure everything. Measure absolutely everything that you possibly can. Most tools out there are free. Google Analytics, free. DevTools, free. Charles Proxy, it's got a free version. The free version shuts down after 30 minutes, so you have to keep restarting it. That's fine. We can live with that. Uh, speed curve, really cheap. You can run one test for one cent. So you can look at, like, you know, for $20 a month, you can run 2,000 tests. It's cheap. There's no reason not to do it. Uh, the statistics and data in this talk were provided by these people, unless otherwise stated. And the very th last thing I want to do is just thank you all for listening. Thank you for your time.